Suzanne is a watercolor artist and a professional photographer. Tonight, she will show us how her heart, her hand, and her head work together to create her art on imperial size paper. It's my privilege to introduce tonight's skilled watercolorist and also a fun and gracious lady, Suzanne Schaff. <laughs> Thank you. I, I thank my cheering squad. <laughs> and I also am really tickled that you all could be here tonight. It's uh, the weather didn't particularly cooperate. People have been dropping like flies the last hour, haven't they, Mary? <laughs> it's, it's, it's been pretty nuts. So I was asked, as, as Mary said, I was asked here tonight to talk about my watercolor process with in relationship to using Imperial size paper. Imperial size paper is 29 and a half by 41 inches. So it's not quite twice as the size of a regular sheet of watercolor paper that most of us have grown up on. So I will be talking specifically about how to use the um, how to, how to work with the paper and um, what I had to do with paints and, and any adjustments that I needed to make. I'm also going to talk about the nitty gritty of the art making process um, in terms of the role of, that photography plays in my art process. Um, there's just very little division between what I do um, in photography and, and what I do in painting. And someday I would like to be a professional painter, make some money that way. Hi, Jenny, <laughs> my sister. Um, I'm also going to talk about the Cuban portrait project and the creative process that goes along with that and, um, and what it takes to make a portrait more than just a likeness of a person. So, okay, if everybody will turn off their phones and make sure they're not going ching or anything like that, I would, I would be so appreciative. Thank you very much. You folks at home, that doesn't apply to you. So the first thing I want to talk about is the development of my personal painting style. And this took a long time to do. I was first in Oops. I was first introduced to watercolor back in the 1970s in the days of wet onto wet. And those of you who um, grew up in watercolor during that time probably remember that it was called slop and drip. And I had a friend, Bob, he and I would go out and paint and Bob could make the most incredible slop and drip paintings. Me, not so much. As a matter of fact, it turned out to be an absolute non-starter. So I left watercolor alone, and I didn't do any watercolor for almost 29 years. Now, I also left teaching. I was a, an art teacher for a long time. So Mary was an art teacher. Who else in here was an art teacher? All right, we have more people. We have more people. All right, there's, there's always art teachers, especially in, in any art group. And um, it's really nice to see them, to see you all. So... I left academia in 2000. I moved to Denver and my plan was to start a photography business. It turned out that I primarily shot weddings and I became a part of the wedding photography community um, in Denver, which was an absolutely wonderful, wonderful group. One of the things that I learned is that there are 48,000 weddings along the front range every year and there's only about 250 water, uh, wedding photographers. And that changed things because instead of all of us competing with each other for a few number of weddings, it opened the door so that we didn't have to sell ourselves on, well, here's my great album that I can do for you. Or, well, let's see if we can negotiate that price down just a little bit to meet your, your wedding budget. No, instead, we were in the enviable position of being able to sell our services based on our artistic styles in photography. And that was, that was an amazing thing. So 
it, it really, it honestly really changed the dialogue with the photographers in, in Denver. And it brought it to the point where I would choose you as much as you would choose me. And I only had to take the clients who wanted to only work with me. And I really, really loved it. So as you know, when you're going through all of these different um, stages of, of learning any skill, there's a point at which you hit a benchmark or a point at which you hit a game changer. So I want to show you one of the game changers in, in, uh, in photography. So, all right, here's my password. <laughs> okay, oops. So do we... Oh, <laughs> okay, so, it's on, oh, um, we didn't practice that, there we go, how do you like that? <laughs> I shot this at Stephanie's wedding, and this is the other image that I, oops, that's not Stephanie's wedding. This is the other image that I shot at Stephanie's wedding. And these two images turned out to be really defining moments for me. Um, I saw these and I realized I'm onto something. I really like these. I liked the black and white photojournalistic approach. I liked using the wide angle to create an ensemble. Is it gone? Okay. Uh, I liked the wide angle ensemble and the way it just grabbed a moment in time and an emotion. And let's see, let's go back to Steph. Oops. All right. Okay, well, there, there we go. And I just, and I thought that, I, I think I, I, I really like these. Um, another photographer friend of, of mine, when I, uh, when I started to show these um, around in the early years um, said, all right, let me describe your images to you. And this was a huge help. And he said, they're gritty, they're energetic, they're intense, and they're sassy. And I just thought to myself, all right, I'm good with that. that. That really resonated. And that became my trademark. That became the style of wedding photography that I sold. And the neat thing about this is that once I would get to a wedding and get in the groove and start really, really shooting, the kind of shooting where you're just rocking back and forth, you're just, you know, you take a shot, you look for the next shot, you're just so full of energy. And that just took away a lot of the stress of shooting a wedding. Now, let's circle back around to watercolor. Talk about stress. <laughs> so what I wanted to do was to figure out if I could find a style of, water of, of photography that really worked for me, couldn't I find a style of painting that was also going to work for me? So I talked to Frank Wetzel, who became my mentor about seven years ago when I started back into watercolor. Um, I think I said I took a 29-year hiatus. I didn't pick up a brush. I had so many other things I was interested in doing. So I just, I just stepped away from watercolor. But I wanted to come back. Um, my schedule was starting to work. I had shifted from doing a lot of lifestyle photography to doing business photography, which I really, really have loved. And so I wanted to see if I went back to watercolor, what could I, what would my hand do? What would happen when I held a brush in my hand and I got rid of all of the shoulds and all of the ideas that I needed to make my painting look like this thing or that thing? What would happen if I just let myself, my hand naturally apply the paint to paper? So I want to show you, um, I want to show you my first real 
watercolor. Oh, that works perfectly. So this is shadow leaf. And I found this old leaf in uh, Havana, Cuba. It's the leaf's about that big. Um, I had a Ziploc bag with me. So I stuck the leaf in, blew up the bag, sealed it and put it in my checked luggage. And it arrived home just fine. It was it was great. So I brought it, I brought it into my studio and set up portrait lighting. And I started to photograph this and other leaves as though they were portraits. I was so, you know, I knew lighting, I knew portraiture. And I mean, a leaf is pretty simple, isn't it? Well, no, but <laughs> it was the thing I started with. So this was my starting point. And the thing I also, the, well, the reason I chose this particular leaf is that I brought this from Cuba. Cuba is a mysterious place. And I liked the, the position of being able to look under the leaf and to look at the shadow because you, you looked around the shadows when you were in Cuba. You kind of looked over your shoulder a little bit. You kept your eye open. So shadow leaf was the first major um, um, artwork that I did. And the thing that was, that led to the development of a style. Finally, I'm getting to the point. So I start, I start out leaf paintings. Um, I started out the leaf painting right before this, and I was um, trying to do the slop and drip method, lots of water, wet onto wet, and it really wasn't working. It wasn't working any better than it did by this time 30 years before. So what I had learned from working with Frank Wetzel, my mentor for a very short time, is he said, don't feel like you always have to use the tried and true watercolor traditions. He said, the idea is to make your artwork say something and do whatever you have to do to make it speak. So I was, um, I, I took that to heart. And the other thing that he told me um, after one of the first exercises, he had me paint this, this little barn and a road going up to the barn. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? This is not what I'm interested in. This is not what I want to do. Um, and I, I got this little ditty painted and I'm like, okay, Frank, here you go. And then his next thing he said was, okay, now scrub it out. What do you mean scrub it out? He said, yeah. He said, scrub it. You can scrub that down to white paper. Oh, the missing element. So when I was working on the leaf right before this, which still isn't finished, okay? Let's just face it, it isn't finished. But I was, I was working on it and water was everywhere. Got out the hair dryer, I dried it off. And instead of just tossing it in the, in the pile and saying, I, I'm not gonna do this, this isn't working at all. I thought, okay, let's get out the scrub brush. Let's scrub some of this off. And so I would scrub a little bit. I liked it. I kind of liked the way it looked. It, it looked leaf-like and dabbed in some really rich um, color and started to scrub in the color. So I was using the brush to apply and scrub the, the, um, the paint into the paper instead of relying on water to do that. And that, and that was really starting to work. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Why don't I chisel down some of these old brushes? And so I was able to lift lines out. So this was the beginning of my, my new style. I was so excited because it wasn't really easy, but it was easier than anything else I had ever done in watercolor. It made me love doing watercolor. I felt like I could finally do this. So I'm using this, put the paint on, mix it around, add some more color, a little dry brush, a little scrubbing out, a little defining here and there. I'm good. Really, that, that, was, that really worked. That was really working. So from here, I went into, um, Frank and I were talking about it, and, and he, was, he, was, he was bored with my leaves. I was shocked because I was loving my leaves. <laughs> you know how 
how it is. You, you, you ask that important person in your life, you know, come on in and, and take a look at what, you know, at what we're doing. And they're just like, ho-hum. Well, that's kind of the response I got from Frank. And he said, what do you really want to do? I'm just like, well, I'm a portrait photographer. I prefer photographing people. I love to photograph people. I would like to learn how to paint people. So we set up a project and I was painting people and I got to the point where all I had to, left to do was the face. And I, you know, I was just like, uh, I don't know if I can do this face. And Frank said, well, didn't, don't you have some photographs that your friend Mary took of you in your green silk shirt? And I, oh yeah. He goes, well, why don't you practice on one of those? So I, I pulled out the, uh, the photograph, um, drew it up and then um, put in the background, hated the background because at that point I still couldn't make, I, I couldn't draw a bead of watercolor down a page for anything. Um, yeah, you look, you look exactly like you know what I'm talking about. And so I thought, wait a second, don't throw it away. Get out one of your old oil painting brushes, one of those stiff brushes and go to it. And I did. And, and so I'm working around on this and I'm getting a texture I really, really like. So I'm pretty excited about it. So I start working with Frank's close supervision on how to paint a face. And it actually went pretty well. I really enjoyed doing it. It wasn't quite as scary as I thought it was going to be. So all of you who have been avoiding faces, it's not as scary as you think. Okay. And, and then um, because the face worked out, I mean, this was just going to be an exercise. Um, I decided to go ahead and do the, the green shirt. Now, I did the green shirt with a completely different technique. The, um, the shadow on the shirt um, is all done with India ink because I wanted to be able to work in um, and get that, that really rich silk look. And we decided India ink would, would do it. So it took me about two weeks to paint all of the, the shadowing and the nuances um, in India ink and 15 minutes to paint the green part. Mixed it up. Yep, that matches. Just, it was done. That's the beauty of India ink. It doesn't move once it, once it dries. So, so that is the, that is the story of these first two. So let me take a look and see where I am now. So I was really excited because I had found something that was working. And I was just incredibly, incredibly pleased with that. So now I want to, let's see here. All right, so now I want to demonstrate. I figured if I'm gonna talk about the style and I'm so excited about the style that maybe you'd like to have me demonstrate how I do this stuff, how I do this, this style where I put down paint, take away paint, and just make, um, use a lot of different brushes. So we're going to work on Rooster Man. So Rooster Man is a, all right, so this is going to be upside down. Is there something I can do from here? Oh, I just have to tap the screen. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. I can move it. All right. Okay. So this is Rooster Man. And I'm going to use him to demonstrate to demonstrate this technique that I've developed for myself. So I was in the studio the other night and I put in the, the two blues. There really aren't two blues because his shirt is contiguous, but I'm going to see them as two different blues for the purpose of blending them together. Now, this is a little trick that I figured out um, a couple of months ago. And I had bins of paint 
some of the paint I had from my um, um, University of Iowa days back in the early 70s, some paint from, how you know how it is. How many of you have a whole bunch of paint, old, new? And I thought, it's time for me to figure out just exactly what I've got. And so I went in and I made a swatch of every color that I had. And these swatches have been absolutely wonderful because, let's see, is that, is that the right? That's not too bad. That looks like it's pretty much the right blue. Or, wait a second, is this a closer match? No, not quite. Maybe in the dark areas, but obviously not otherwise. It just, it takes a lot of the guessing, a lot of the experimenting and messing around out of, of what you're doing. So I settled on French ultramarine. And so we're going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and show you the next step in what I've done. Now, I used to be an art teacher, so I was demonstrating for, for students all the time, but that's 35 years ago. So this is, so you are going to see a first. I have in my, I have in my box, all of these brushes that are all oil paint or acrylic brushes. And I use them all the time. This is a brand new one. Haven't used it yet because I haven't needed it yet. Okay. So I'm going to, I've already put down a medium area and one of my darker areas. So my next step then is to blend. My next, okay. My next step is to blend um, the two areas together and also to take away a little bit of paint so that I can um, find the highlights. Is that going to, does that look? Well, this looks a lot more interesting. At least I hope it does. So let me find the brush I want. When you have this many brushes, how many of you have more brushes than you actually need? Nobody? Huh, okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to use. Since I have such a great lab, um, a photo lab, I, you know, why work off of poor quality photos when you can um, go to the lab and or send things to the lab? So this is this is going to be just a few, uh, a very brief demonstration. So what I want to do. is I want to find, I want to find the highlights. I already have um, about as dark as I want to go. I've got it, it's about as dark as I want to go and I have the medium shades. So I'm going to start next by looking for the lighter areas. And one thing I had intended to do, and so I'll do it right now, is I probably am going to leave the background on Rooster Man completely white like I did on the barber. I like the way that looks, and it doesn't, it's not always the right thing, but I think in this case it'll be a, um, a good idea. So I'm going to mask off just a little bit with Dick Blick white tape. It's amazing how many Dick Blick things we use. 
and get my little scissors so I can cut it and can make it curve. And then kind of smash it down. I don't want to spend too much time doing this, just enough so I can show you. Okay. In my studio, I do 90% of my work on an easel. Just I, I have a really heavy duty easel. I have a little stool um, that goes up and down with wheels on it. And it's really neat because the wheels are really small and that whole base is really small. So I'm not constantly running into the base with, with my foot. So let's see about this. So I'm going to start and I'm going to pull away And I'm going to really focus on this area right here. It doesn't take a lot. Is it starting to, can, oh, it's kind of hard to see. As soon as I'm doing that, I'm creating the illusion of a fold. That's what all of this is about, is creating illusions. And if I want it to be a little sharper, I can use a different brush. And eventually, if I do that long enough, it really starts to look like a fold. Cobalt, this, well, actually, this is the ultramarine, and it's a more staining pigment. Not everybody likes to work with ultramarine because it's hard sometimes to, um, to pull back up, as I'm experiencing here. So rather than spend a lot of time doing that, though, I want to... I'll walk around just really quickly so you can see how the three different values of light, dark, and medium show up. That's all right. Is that so. Back in, back in elementary school. <laughs> All right, now let's turn the page. All right. Okay, there, I have officially done a demonstration. So we can go on from here. <laughs> so. Now, because I think demonstrations are really fun to watch, I, um, but very impractical in a, um, in a live setting like this. I have made a, um, a slideshow. That's Tony's cue. I've made a slideshow of the process of painting uh, the Barber of Baracoa. So, 
Take a look. So that's from the original photo. Started right in this little notch. I didn't want to commit. So I put on the lightest layer, and then I started to put on some medium layers, and then I jumped to my darkest layers. So this is all going on little by little and being scrubbed in a lot with a dry brush. So that's right in here. That's pretty intense for watercolor, isn't it? On the pants, I mostly used cobalt and cerulean blue. So now the pocket's on. Sometimes I think it, for me, it amounts to just get some paint on the paper and we'll deal with it later. Um, off and on about four months. So now we're working on his shirt. We are working on his shirt. I'm working on the shirt. <laughs> Lesson from working on the shirt. Don't put mask it on and leave it for more than three or four days. You'll, when you look at this real closely, you'll see where the mask it had to be dug out. So working on the foot down here. Little by little, put on some paint, take some paint off. Watercolor paint is so plastic. You can take a brush or it's, um, kind of a trowel almost, and you can move it. You can take it from one place, get it wet, move it into another place. I'll, I'll talk about um, paper and all in just a few minutes, okay? And then take care of the mystery of the paper. <laughs> So now we're working in here, his chair. And this actually is India ink. I wanted that to be solidly black. Nope, nothing's India ink except just this back, this metal back plate. Because once you put on India ink, you can't move it around. So the underpainting for his hands and arms, you see how it's, it's almost a graphic design and then it starts to be blended. I'm hoping there's a day when I can just do that normally, like other watercolorists. But in the meantime, I'm doing this particular method. I'm looking for the light, always looking for the light. That's the thing that I bring with me from photography. So I needed better glasses for him. And I found those. The lightest layer on first, the darkest layer on second, and then working everything in between.
when you're when you're photographing, make sure that you take a look at things in black and white, desaturate, so that you can get a really good idea of how your value structure is working. Okay, a pair of scissors. How hard is it to draw a pair of scissors? Apparently difficult for me. So my friend Jean sat there with the scissors. I photographed them. I worked all over the, I worked overtime on these puppies. So there you go. Thanks, Tony. So this is the, this is the barber. And it was, it's really cool because I only left in the background, the back corner and I just put a pencil line in. I thought I would try a number of different ideas um, to see what kind of background, because the original barber photo, so this is the original barber photo. And so I thought, well, all right, let's see if there's something else I can do that's more simple. And I um, photographed the barber, went over to Kinko's and had um, 10 color copies made so that I could draw on them. And um, after drawing on them, I realized that there wasn't anything I wanted except these three lines. That was it. He, he was more graphic. He had a lot more power, I thought, without doing anything to the background. So now this is interesting. I, I love this. Um, Carl Oldbeck, who was our judge last spring, he was looking at this and he was so tickled because he noticed that the line on the back wall was cut right where it goes with the scissors. And I was just like, oh, really? <laughs> Let me tell you, <laughs> I inadvertently erased part of that line when I was making those darn scissors. <laughs> but he saw that, he made that interpretation and by golly, we're gonna own it. It's great. <laughs> I was so tickled with that. Okay, so anyway, um, I'm gonna talk next about working with, um, um, size paper. But in the meantime, all right, so let me get to the point about imperial size paper. It's been a long time since I've done a presentation, so <laughs> things are a little scripted. <laughs> all right, so in brush strokes, this our wonderful publication, which whoever's in charge of, who's in charge of this? It's fabulous. So Jeanette is in charge of this. So in, in, brush, in brush strokes, I boldly made the statement about this. There's more to painting an imperial size sheet of watercolor paper than just making everything bigger. It's a qualitatively different painting experience. And I wrote that back in October, and I have been since going back and forth. Is it really a completely different experience? Is it a different experience for the artist, for the audience? And if it, if it is, in what way? And the only thing I really came up with for myself as, as the artist is that sometimes I needed a great big piece of paper to get across a big idea to get across something that had where I wanted to give it more power than just the casual glance. So that is that is the main reason that I um, am using um, imperial sized paper is because I want something to be a bigger idea. I want to emphasize it, put it right up there front and center. And also because of the way I draw. When I was back at the University of Iowa as a kid, I was working with an art professor and he could see that I was struggling in class as we were um, working from the figure. And, um, and so uh, Carl Fracassini said, well, 
I want you to go down to Iowa Book and Crook and get the, um, the biggest um, water, not watercolor, the biggest newsprint pad you can find, which I did. And when I brought it to class, he said, this is a graphite stick. I'd never used one of those. He said, the nice thing about working large is that you can work from your shoulder. And I'm like, oh, so set it all up. You held the graphite stick and I started, I started to draw and it was a game changer. I could make the sweeping moves of the figure. It, it worked. That was, that worked. That was one of those things that worked for the first time. And it was really, it was really a delight to do that. So part of the reason I'm doing this imperial sized um, um, artwork is because I like to work big. It's, it, you know, no big, heavy philosophical thing. I just like to work big. I like the power of, of a large size. Now, here's an interesting thing too. One of my photography or one of my art friends over in the California building where I have my studio said to me, you know, if you really intend to make some money in watercolor, you're gonna to have to make an awful lot of watercolors because you can't sell them for that much. She said, I can sell big, oil paintings for three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000. And she really could, and she did on a regular basis. And I was just, I, I thought about that. I'm just like, okay, so if I made big watercolors, if we, the watercolor community, worked larger, then would we actually be able to, um, you know, maybe sell these things for a little bit more? So that's, that's just one small idea. But with, uh, when I was working with um, uh, photography clients, especially clients who were um, family photography clients, uh, they would say, okay, we want a picture for over our fireplace. And I'm just like, okay, let me come and we'll, we'll measure this. So I had a bunch of frames, all different sizes from eight by 10 to um, 30 by 40. And I would go into these big McMansion sort of places um, out, in the, out in the Denver metro area. And um, I'd say, so what do you have in mind? Well, we're thinking that we're going to go with an 8 by 10 this year for our family portrait. <laughs> I'm just like, all right. I whip out the 8 by 10 frame and I put it up on the mantle and they're going, oh, <laughs> that's not going to work. <laughs> so we keep putting frames up there till we get to have the right size, the right proportion, the right orientation. And that turned out to be a really, really interesting way of approaching it. So then while I was at their house, I said, where else do you want to have um, uh, pictures displayed? Well, I've got, this, I've got this place in my hall. The hallway's this big. It's, it's this it's this narrow and you know, it's long as this table. And I wanna fill this whole wall with family photographs. Okay, so then we start talking about what size do you need so that when you are looking at it from a very short distance that you really do get to see the photo. So we start talking about what I call optimum viewing distance. And with the optimum viewing distance, there are three different, um, there are three different positions. There's the position that I call first glance. You walk into a room and in my apartment, I walk into the doorway and the barber is about that far away. So I see him the first glance. And the neat thing about this very large um, artwork is that it tells the beginning of a story right at first glance. And then I get to the optimum viewing distance and the way you determine that is when you're standing in front of an artwork and you kind of put your hands out like this, what's too close, what's too far? You don't wanna see things in your peripheral vision, but you want to see this, you want to see the whole thing. So that's your optimum viewing distance. And then there's always the reward. That's when you go in close up and take a good look. So, in a lot of smaller artworks, watercolor typically being smaller um, in, you know, in, people work a little bit smaller. We have a 
places where you can put them, where you have optimum viewing distance, and then you can step up to them and you can really see the detail um, and really get a flavor for uh, the technique. They don't have as big a presence when you get back. One of the, that's one of the reasons that I think working large um, with watercolor would be something you might want to try for that reason. So here's a sheet of water of the um, imperial size watercolor paper. You buy imperial size watercolor paper at Joe's Artorama. Ten sheets, three hundred pound for $250, free shipping. Or you can go to wet paint and get it for between 45 and $55 a sheet. Now this is the Artistico Fabriano, which I am liking a great deal. This is tough. And I need my watercolor paper to be tough because I've been known to scrub right through it. Kind of, yes, I think we, we've all probably had that experience at one point or another. So you can scrub this stuff down like crazy and it'll still, it'll still hang together. So Artistico Fabriano, it's beautiful, beautiful paper. I love working with it. Now the paper probably would stand up on its own, but you don't wanna, you don't wanna handle just you know, a single sheet of paper, even though it's 300 pound. So Dick Blick, bless their little buttons, has a, a foam core board that's three eighths of an inch. I mean, this is really flimsy stuff, three eighths of an inch thick. And they have it in 30 by 42. So your watercolor paper fits right on it. So what I did is I would take two pieces of the foam core board, Elmer's glue them together so that it's, it's a little over a half an inch about um, um, what, a little over half an inch thick. And then I would mount the, um, the uh, Fabriano on by taking strips of double stick tape all the way across about every six inches, all the way down. And in doing that, rubbing it down, getting it to stick, then I will, um, come in and put white, um, once again, Dick Blick tape. Um, I will put the tape along the edge and that keeps the whole thing together. Typically, when I'm working on 140 pound uh, full size sheets of paper, I staple them, I put them in the bathtub, stretch it, staple it to the board with the paper tape and, and all of that. Um, but it takes a three quarter inch uh, piece of plywood to do that. And I'm not even sure I can lift a three quarter inch piece of plywood this size. So this works out, this works out well. It's very lightweight. And um, because the paper is so stout, it's, it's not going to buckle in, unless you're doing something really, really wet over a sustained period. So at this point, I've talked about my style. I've talked about the, um, uh, the paper and the substrate that I use. What questions do you have? Let's take a little question and answer break here. Do you, um, do you want to repeat the question? The question was, if she used the, the method of painting lights first, dark second, and then putting in the medium values next, if that's what you also use. Yes, actually, actually, um, this, like I said, this is the very first um, portrait that I ever painted. And um, I didn't do quite that. Um, I did put in the light tones first, and in kind of in kind of a basic way, I ended up putting in the um, the darks next. But um, 
it, and it, it worked back and it worked back and forth. Now that you ask that, Lynn, um, that is pretty much what I did there. And um, and I painted most of this at home, and then I'd show Frank what, what I was what I was doing, and and that worked out. But it wasn't until I started the Cuban series that I really made that um, an actual technique for myself. So next, okay. So these are some of the questions that are online, and I hope you answered them a bit. Uh, the first one was, "What watercolor paper are you using that you're scrubbing it?" oil brushes and it's still being sustained. It's the Artistico Fabriano, 300 pounds. Also, your colors are so vibrant. Well, I, I use different, I use different things for that. And for example, in the case of all of these different reds, I found I wasn't getting quite the depth that I wanted. So I have laid in um, um, quite a selection of uh, these Dr. Martin inks. And, and I like doing that because you get maximum color, maximum saturation without a heavy residue. So it's more of a, a, of a stain. Thank you. There was one more. Um, can, uh, do you commit shape and value to smaller areas of your larger puzzle? I know. I'll see. Hmm. So the question was, do you commit shape and value to smaller areas of the larger puzzle? Well, when I was, um, when we were looking at the slideshow of painting the barber, um, you know, haven't we all heard that we're supposed to start and paint the background first and, and then work from back to front? All I wanted to do with this guy is make these blue jeans. I, I just, I love the blue jeans and I'm just like, okay, I'm gonna make this and I'm gonna make the blue jeans. So, um, so basically what, what I did was I segmented it all off. As you can see, I started here and I did this and I did this and this and this and then the shirt. And so as I'm working in each of these areas, I'm being very, very conscious of how I can shape them with light, with value, and also to keep them so that they moved one into the next shape. I hope that that answers the question. No. <laughs> Not typically, they're, they're more of a stain. So, um, so you're pretty committed once, once you put them on. So you've used those, Mary? No, but you got to commit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> okay. Compare and contrast against what? Okay. Okay. So let me let me go ahead and go into the next part of of the talk because I'm going to answer your question there. All righty. Okay. So that's so. Let's do a quick. We're going to do a quick discussion about how I work. And this is the Artograph. I bought it at Wet Paint. Um, runs around seven hundred fifty bucks, and it's worth every penny. It's, and if you ever need to borrow it, you can get this, but you also get me, <laughs> because I will come to your house or your studio, or you can come to my studio, and I'll run it for you, and I'll even help you draw. So one of the things that people often ask me um, is, do you work from photographs? And I'm like, yeah, you bet I do. Photography is part of my process. I use photography as a way of going out into the world and capturing ideas 
and putting those ideas together. And when I do that, then I don't always use just the photo. I'm trying to use the photo as a springboard for a portrait that, as Mary White would say, is more than a likeness. So we all need to work from photos oftentimes. It's great if we can go into a drawing class and, and draw a picture or, um, 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 Jenny, could I have you for about a month coming over to the studio so I can draw you every day and make a painting of you? <laughs> I'll even bring lunch. So, um, so some things are more practical and, and working from photographs um, really, really is helpful. I also like to draw, so I feel very confident in drawing. So the first um, drawing that I did the, uh, was the, um, the woman, um, Cuban woman in her doorway. And I drew that out pretty much by looking at the photo. And I realized that that wasn't working as, as well, because when you're working large, you end up needing to make sure that your structure, your underlying structure on your painting is strong and large. Your, your successes are large, your mistakes are large. So you wanna make sure you really nail it before you start to paint. Take some messing around. Um, I don't. You can look at this at the, at the end, and you'll see that I have photo that I have drawn and drawn and drawn and drawn. And when it comes right down to it, I don't oftentimes need all of that detailed drawing. I just need the big shapes, and then I can go from there. So um, yeah, so that's. That's all part of it. So I, I do project. It depends. And, um, you know, I photograph this this woman down in Cuba. So um, I didn't have a way of really checking back. But when I was taking the picture, I took quite a few. I really liked the foreshortened. I, I liked that composition of that. And so I asked her, you know, just kind of, you don't mind standing there, do you? And oh, no, that was great. Her grandkids were out playing on the sidewalk right in front of her. And so I photographed from a number of positions so that I could feel like I was getting rid of any distortion that would be exaggerated and distracting. So I work with it by shooting multiple photos. Okay, so. Oh God, I'll tell you the story of the barber here in a few minutes. <laughs> yes, remind me to do that, Mary. Um, so, so I wanted to also make another comment about how I work. Um, this is the most indispensable tool in, in my studio. I start it's my iPad. I start every session by taking a picture. And then I sit down and write about it for just a minute or two. Okay, this is what I need to do. And at the end of the day, at the end of the work session, then I take, well, sometimes I take pictures all through the session, but then I take an, another picture that is the final picture for the end of, of the work session. And Sometime when I'm at home, I'll sit down and I'll, I'll look at the picture and I'll write about it and I will um, decide what is my next move? What's the next thing I'm going to, to paint? So I had my studio in my office, in my home when I lived over in St. Paul and it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work for me is that I couldn't separate myself. If the door was open, I could always see that there was something that needed to be done, and it was making me crazy. My mentor, Frank, who's now in his 80s, um, said to me right at the beginning of COVID, 
do you want my studio? I'm not going to use it. And it's over in the California building. And I'm like, oh, Frank, thank you. Yes. Can we clean your junk out? <laughs> Eventually we did. And so I, I have this it, it's 16 by 16 by 16. Seriously, it's a 16 foot box cube. And it's, it's the perfect place. So when I go to the studio, I know exactly what I'm going to do, and what I want to accomplish in that session at the studio. I drive over there, walk in, do my quick check, make a few notes and start painting. And when I have finished that particular assignment that I gave to myself for the day, then I leave. I do my pictures, pack up, and leave. And I do that so that I can learn to discipline myself to paint when I'm in my studio, to not go to my studio, to just hang out, do email. Um, now, there are other people in the California building who come in and, and we visit, and that's great um, because we always end up talking. This is what usually happens. We talk about my work and then we go th to their studio and talk about their work. And, and so, uh, you know, building a really, a really nice community of, of, of artists together. But I want to get rid of that piddly farting. Oh, did I just say that on <laughs> national television? Um, around that is unproductive. So I just go when I know what I'm going to do. Sometimes it takes a lot longer. I'm there a couple of hours. Sometimes the task takes an hour, an hour 15, and I leave. So, so that's, that's one of the things that um, I'm trying to become more disciplined. And taking pictures all the time really, really helps me see how I'm progressing. And sometimes I can shoot it look at it the next day um, at home and realize, oh, that's why it's not working. So it's, it's a great way, um, it's a great feedback loop uh, for you. Okay, so I want to go ahead. Um, how are we doing on time, Mary? What? <laughs> oh, you poor people, you've endured so much. Okay, so I wanna to tour you through the Cuban collection. And um, these, these are all related, except this one, um, to the Cuban collection. My connection to Cuba started when I was 11 years old. So back in 1962, I was 11 at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And that had a big impact on me. Um, developmentally, children are at a point where they really start to understand the structure of the world, the geopolitical um, you know, aspects of the globe. And um, I knew that, that Cuba was right in our back door. And they had missiles aimed at the White House and number two, SAC Air Force Base. And we didn't live that far from Omaha, Nebraska. And we were expected to have, if missiles hit there, um, four to eight weeks of fallout. So people in our community were building fallout shelters. We all knew how to get down under our desk. It was a scary time. And for a long time, Fidel Castro was the boogeyman under the bed for me. So I'd always wanted to go to Cuba. I needed to kind of, you know, work that through. And then, so the neat thing that happened is, is that back in 2008, when Cuba was a lot more accessible to us, a couple of my photographer friends from Denver went and they came back with these absolutely fabulous pictures of these vibrant people who just, you know, look like they could rock the world. Well, that didn't square with what I thought people were living through. And so I was like, wait a second, this, I got, now I really have to go. Now I really have to, to go and see. So I, um, I, went in 2014. And as I was getting ready to go, I was um, reading quite a bit more about, about Cuba. And Carlos Franchi, who was the editor-in-chief of La Revolution, which was the newspaper um, that started in, in um, 1959 at the time of the revolution, he said in the 70s, he said, it was never the intention to change the basic nature the warm-hearted, happy-go-lucky Cuban people. 
It was never the intention of the revolution to change them. And in that respect, the revolution was a success. Okay, well, all right, so that made sense. So I went to Cuba and what I found were beautiful, vibrant people who were warm and welcoming, who asked me into their homes, who would visit with me in my really, really crummy Spanish. And they would listen and, and, and of course, correct me, <laughs> which, which was just fine. So this is, the, uh, this is called Cuban Woman About My Age in Her Doorway. I photographed her in the old southeastern part of Cuba, the, the El Oriente part. And she's just a grandmother hanging out in her front door. There was another grandmother down here, two houses. She was hanging out in her front door too. The kids were all playing in the street. It was, it was lovely. And I liked that. So I wanted to use... Um, not only, I mean, she was wearing a red top. She had on, on, on a different kind of skirt, but I wanted to show that very open feeling. I mean, this is a very open gesture. Well, I mean, and doing in her case, it's not vulnerable. It's very confident. She's comfortable. She knows who she is. She's lived through some pretty bad times and she's still popped out. Then in Havana, I uh, photographed this woman. The name of this um, um, painting is called Havana Honey. Um, some other women I paint with came up with the name. So, so Havana Honey. And she was standing in her, another one, standing in her doorway, just like that. And, and I came up to her and I, I said, I like your dress in my really bad Spanish. And she said in her really bad English, I like the color of your lipstick. And the two of us just beamed at each other. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. You know, it was one of those fall in love for 60 seconds. And so I, so I took pictures of, once again, four or five or six pictures of her. But this one I thought was just so beguiling, the way she was in her doorway, her engagement with me. This picture was very problematic, I'll have to say, because let me show you the original. You see, there was some really nasty green in this one. And I was having a, a miserable time. I scrubbed this part out three or four times, getting rid of different colors that just simply weren't working. So. I finally settled on what I had there because quite honestly, I didn't think the paper was gonna take any more paint. And this is one of the few cases where I used a white gouache because I needed to tone this. So I mixed a little bit of, of, um, of a blue, actually it's, a, it's Payne's gray with a white gouache so that I could get the impression of that chalky, stucco-y paint. So that was one of the few times I've done anything like that. So I had, I had great fun with her. Then the next, the next person I did was the barber of Baracoa. And Baracoa is a seaside town down in the southeastern part in the El Oriente uh, province. And so the barber of Baracoa, it was a dark and stormy night. And I was out on the streets of Baracoa. It was getting late and I was soaked. I had my camera in a Ziploc bag and an umbrella just kind of nominally over my head. It was one of those nights where I was too far from home and it was getting late. I needed, I needed to kind of get out to get out of there. And there are those three guys who are kind of across the street who were a little drunk, who were, hey, gringa, you know, mujer, you know. And I thought, okay, it's, it's time to call it a night. So I dashed under the overhang in front of his door and um, 
was figuring that I needed to get the camera back in the bag, get it dried off. And so I turned to use the light coming out of his doorway. And there he was. And I'm like, oh, he was just sitting in his chair, clicking his scissors. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, this is getting really sketchy. <laughs> so I leaned into it, raised my teacher eyebrow. And he nodded. Actually, he blinked. You know how a cat blinks? Just that nice, slow ascent. That's what this guy did. I took one picture, one frame, and then I got the hell out of there. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was time. So, so the barber of Baracoa, there's only one picture of this dude. <laughs> And, um, and he has just been so much fun to, to work on. Um, but th there's a lot of interesting um, sub stories in, in this. When you look at it, you'll see that um, he has kind of a glare in his glasses. And rather than taking that away, I made sure that that was, was in because there's kind of a little bit of distance between myself and him, almost like he's trying to hide something. So my brother and his wife and, and Jenny and her husband were at my um, um, dining room table um, having a brunch. And after everybody left, my brother Tom said, I've been sitting there looking at that guy for the last hour. He's a really sinister. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And Tom said, kind of makes you wonder, what did he do in the revolution? <laughs> so I always, I always thought, that, okay, yes, he, there, he is a little sinister. <laughs> um, so anyway, but this is the painting that I just finished. And this one has had many, many different names. Um, but I've settled on a time for grace or time for grace, time of grace. I don't know, whatever I put on the application form. <laughs> and I wanna show you, I wanna show you that and tell you a little bit about her story. The Cuban people, especially, well, all over the island where I was, but in Havana, when I was in Havana one day, I'm out on the street shooting and this woman is, you know, like, vente, 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 you know, I mean, come here, come here. And I'm like, Okay, and so she steps through the doorway of her house. There are people sitting around in the, the living room kitchen talking about open concept. Um, <laughs> it's not as big as this. And um, she runs up the stairs. And I'm just like, okay. So I followed her up the stairs and she's standing there posing and explaining to me that she is a voodoo person and that these are the things that are part of her voodoo altar. And I'm going, okay. <laughs> so I'm, so I'm, I'm photographing her. I'm photographing her. Now, taking a lot of, of artistic license, one of the things that right away um, after I drew her out, I wasn't that interested in the whole voodoo aspect of who she was. I was a lot more interested in something that I saw all over the island. And that was the collection of things she had. The Cuban people have been through so many periods of austerity. They have almost nothing in their homes. They have nothing that's new. You go to, you go to the outdoor booksellers, there's not a new book. Everything's a used book. <laughs> yeah, I, I read a couple of books while I was there and I gave them to them. Um, and so I was, I was very, very interested in, well, what do people have? How do they, how do they decorate their homes? You know, what, what do they own? And they own precious little. Except every time somebody invited me into their home, they wanted to show me that one precious thing that artifact that has been handed down through the family, hidden and rehidden and, and passed off to, that, that came, that was with the family before the revolution. And the thing people showed me most often was something decorative such as a candelabra. So in the original picture, there's a bed here and I got to thinking, 
I don't want the bed. That doesn't do anything for me. Instead, I'm going to make this picture not about voodoo, but I'm going to make it about precious little. So I went to art and architecture over on university. I rented this candelabra for $35 a week and kept it for one week. And I photographed it. Um, and when I photographed it, um, because I knew it was here, I knew it was going to be backlit. So I used the stairwell in the California building, set it up so that it could be backlit so I could have convincing lighting. One of the other roles of photography is that you can get things, you, things are accurate, which um, has a lot more believability, a lot more authenticity. So then I thought, I need to do something else with her. The light background isn't working for me. I had done a red shirt, a red sweater, and I was ready to do a red room. So something I don't typically do is to make preliminary color sketches, but I did here. And I started out by looking in my Russian textiles book to find all sorts of color combinations that started with red. And I brought it so you can do the same thing. So I worked around to try to come up with all these different ideas for um, working red into it. And this pretty much turned out to be what I decided to use. I liked the colors and, um, and I liked the shades. So talk about needing to do something a little bit different because of the size. With brushes and brushwork, one of the things that I've learned is that I was able to use all of my regular size brushes here, over there, and on uh, the woman in her doorway. However, when you need to make a great big, cover a great big area, that's when you're going to need the big brush. And these, these save the day. I thought this one would, I, you know, this one was what, $5? This one was 65 and this doesn't, this just didn't work. You can't carry enough water. And what you need is a vehicle that's going to carry water and then paint. And as you're painting these big areas, I found these wonderful covered dishes at Dick Blick. And you can paint, you can make a great big soup of color and um, you're going to need that when you, um, are painting your great big spaces. So I painted the great big space. I worked with the light. And in the original picture, she looked very dignified, but she also looked a little sour, maybe. And I decided that this is a person who has been through so much. And I can have things different. What I wanted this to speak to was having gone through hardship to redemption to a state of grace. So I made it look like her facial expression portrayed a person who is on the other side. Okay, questions now. <laughs> it almost oh uh, yeah the artograph That's how, so I drew this, I drew this about um, two years ago. And, um, and what I have learned after doing the first one is that I didn't need to draw anything other than just the basic outside shapes. And so that's, and that's what I have been doing um, uh, since then. But yes, I drew out, I drew out a bunch of them um, a, a while ago. And, um, and I realized I don't need to do all that. 
Yes, the pencil marks. All right, um, regular old graphite. Um, if you're going to, if you don't want your lines to show, you will need to get rid of the lines before you paint over them. Now, one thing you can do after you've drawn this is just to use a kneaded eraser and lift the pencil lead. And that, and that helps a lot. So, sure. Who's next? On your final, when you're finally done with your picture, are you putting, like sometimes on an oil or acrylic, we might put a varnish or something over it? Is it everything, anything over a watercolor? Somebody gave a presentation on using a varnish over watercolor. over watercolor. Does anybody know anything about that? Okay, tell us, tell us. Well, no, it takes a long time to talk about it. Okay. So, um, it's definitely a possibility. I'm Georgia Candico and get in touch with me because I'm going to do a class on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. You know, I've, I've, heard about, I've read a little bit about um, emulsifiers. And I don't even know what that would mean. You know, I, I it doesn't even sound right. But I've heard about an emulsifier over a watercolor, and I well, <laughs> I, I just read about it. So anyway, thank you. So I so I want to protect these, and um, um, anything that goes into a show has to have glass on it, and. A, Okay, and um, I decided um, until I learned to do those that I was just going to use a um, um, the um, what do you call it the acrylic, and and that's worked out. But um, that's that's still so horribly expensive to to plexiglass. Yes, thank you for the word. Yes, so this is this is framed in plexiglass, which makes it very very light. Um, this is framed in glass, and this thing is almost heavier than that. So um, I, I recommend that. And, um, but it, it's, you know, these costs in this simple um, arrangement, it's, you know, six or $700 to, to frame it up with the, the high quality plexiglass. But I figured anything that's in a show, I'm gonna pop this out and put in the other. <laughs> All I need is one. So, yes. Exactly. So anyway, what other questions? Okay, let's hear those. I think that I think that you've answered all of them as you as you've been talking, you've answered the other questions that did come up on the chat. Okay. So anyway, well, I think I've held you captive long enough. <laughs> Class dismissed. <laughs>